Well, here's the brief news from the world over this week. Donald Trump's campaign took another unusual turn this week as the GOP nominee has again reshuffled his top staff. A reported reaction to sagging poll numbers, demoted after just two months as campaign chairman, was political veteran Paul Manafort, though he's still with the campaign. Taking the executive reins of the campaign, former investment banker and leader of conservative news outlet Breitbart, Stephen Bannon. Trump pollster Kellyanne Conway will assume the day-to-day -day operations as campaign manager. Neither have run a political campaign before. According to campaign sources, Trump had grown frustrated with his sagging poll numbers, lagging operations in key states, and the continued attempts to temper and moderate his populist outsider approach. Conway said on CNN Thursday that the campaign will sharpen its message, but that Trump will remain authentic. On the campaign trail, Trump is talking terrorism. In a major policy speech on Monday, the Republican nominee said stricter immigration measures are needed in the fight against terrorism. Moving away from his call last year to ban all Muslims from entry to the United States, Trump is now calling for the, quote, extreme ideological venting, or vetting, rather, of immigrants in order to block sympathizers of extremist groups or those who don't embrace American values. He pointed to past terror attacks as evidence for the need to overhaul the immigration system. The common thread linking the major Islamic terrorist attacks that have recently occurred on our soil, 9-11, the Fort Hood shooting, the Boston bombing, the San Bernardino attack, the Orlando attack, is that they have involved immigrants or the children of immigrants. Clearly, new screening procedures are needed. Trump said the battle against Islamic extremism is an ideological one, akin to the Cold War struggle against communism. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton was not impressed with Trump's campaign shakeup. She said it will have little impact on his controversial political message. Clinton told supporters at a rally in Cleveland, there is no new Donald Trump. He can hire and fire anyone he wants, but he's still the same man. The Democrat nominee also went after Trump's tax plan and his own taxes. Under his plans, Donald Trump would pay a lower tax rate than middle class families. Of course, we have no idea what tax rate he pays because <laughs> unlike everybody else who's run for president in the last four or five decades, he refuses to release his tax return so the American people can't really judge. Clinton then took a shot at the rich, promising to go after the super wealthy corporations and Wall Street to pay their fair share in taxes. Meanwhile, abroad, ISIS is on the defensive in three countries. In Libya, after pitched battles throughout the week, government-backed forces have stripped ISIS of its control of almost 200 kilometers of territory along the Mediterranean. The Islamic State has fallen back to the city of Sirte, its last remaining stronghold in the country. Battles continue there. In the Nineveh Plains, Iraqi and Kurdish Peshmerga forces continue to battle Islamic State. This week, more than a dozen villages east and south of Mosul have been liberated after being under ISIS control for two years. Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, remains the last major urban stronghold of the militant group in Iraq. The UN Refugee Agency said this week that more than 100,000 people have been displaced as Iraqi forces cleared territory ahead of the expected battle for Mosul. And in Syria, Russian warplanes targeted ISIS and allied Nusra Front militants in Aleppo and elsewhere, destroying major ammunition depots, training camps, and three command posts. On Friday, U.S.-backed forces retook the city of Manbi. The city was seen as a major loss for the terror group, as it is a key supply route between the Turkish border and Raqqa, ISIS's unofficial Syrian capital. In spite of the battlefield losses, ISIS continues its strategy of terror. On Sunday, a suicide bomber killed over 30 people on the outskirts of Aleppo. And in the Libyan capital city of Sirte, 
a suicide car attack left five people dead and injured more than 30. More on the fight against ISIS here in the U.S., abroad, and what Twitter is doing online in our next segment. And at least 64 people have been murdered in the Democratic Republic of Congo this week in a machete attack by suspected Islamic rebels. Government officials have described the massacre as a revenge attack for successful military operations in the area. The Congolese army says the massacre was carried out by the so-called Allied Democratic Forces, an Islamic group that originated in neighboring Uganda. These killings are the latest in a series that have left over 600 people dead in the region since 2014. And back in the U.S., flood-wracked southern Louisiana is now facing the long-term challenge of recovery. This after what is being described as the worst natural U.S. disaster since Superstorm Sandy. Torrential rains led to historic biblical flooding in the Baton Rouge and Lafayette areas. Some areas saw more than 30 inches of rainfall. 13 people have died, 30,000 needed to be rescued, and more than 40,000 homes have been damaged or destroyed. Hundreds of state and local roadways remain closed. At least 70,000 people have registered for federal disaster assistance. The Federal Emergency Management Agency said it is looking to line up rental properties for those left homeless. They are also considering temporary housing units for the thousands who have been displaced. The devastation is unbelievable. More about the floods and how the people of southern Louisiana have come together in the wake of this disaster later in the program. And Pope Francis continues to reshape the Vatican with two major appointments. Dallas Bishop Kevin Farrell has been selected by the Pope to head a newly created Vatican office for laity, the family, and life. The new dicastery is part of Francis's ongoing curial reform and the merging of the respective pontifical councils for the laity and the family. As prefect of the new mega office, Bishop Farrell will focus on the needs of the laity all over the world. The Dallas bishop has a reputation not unlike that of Pope Francis. He is considered a pastoral moderate with an eye for social justice. He's gone on record recently as being pro-gun control and strongly pro-life, but he is not known as a cultural warrior. And Pope Francis also named an Italian archbishop, Vincenzo Paglia, to head two academic institutes affiliated with that new laity office, the Pontifical Academy for Life and the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family. In an unusual move for the Pope, upon naming Archbishop Paglia to the posts, the Holy Father also issued explicit directives, namely that Paglia should focus on promoting the merciful side of church doctrine. Church watchers note that the appointments signal a more moderate direction for Vatican offices responsible for hot-button issues such as abortion, contraception, marriage, and divorce. And political television pioneer and former Jesuit priest John McLaughlin died this week from complications from prostate cancer. For over three decades, the former priest and speechwriter for President Richard Nixon hosted the nationally syndicated McLaughlin Group. The show revolutionized public affairs program with McLaughlin's brash, combative style of interviewing and debate. Eleanor Cliff, Pat Buchanan, and Mort Kondracki, among others, were part of the panel for 34 years. Their spirited debate inspired many copies, as well as a classic Saturday Night Live spoof by comedian Dana Carvey in the early 1990s. Wrong, Eleanor! This past weekend, McLaughlin made headlines by missing his first show in 34 years due to ill health. In a statement, he said, quote, I'm under the weather, but my spirit is strong and my dedication to the show remains absolute. He passed away at his home in Washington on Tuesday. Bye-bye, John. May you rest in peace.